Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Literature Tonight and welcome to the AI Home. We are connected to AI Kennedy, who is sitting in her house in, in the UK, and it's a great joy to have her with us. Um, we, we will uh, listen to new texts uh, she published, she hasn't published yet. We are very much uh, looking forward to her reading and also, of course, to the conversation. This program, like all other programs in the AI Home, is free of charge and of course, we are grateful for your donations. If you'd like to donate, um, you will see some information on that in the chat window next to, to the video you're just watching. The people who attended A.L. Kennedy's reading last year at the DAI, still physical then, will you remember her unrolling a flag of Europe before she started her reading. And this uh, flag of Europe was adorning her table all the time and said all the time, um, what a passionate and almost fierce, in a very positive sense, what a fierce supporter of Europe she is, of the idea of Europe and also of the idea of community and of standing together, especially in times like these. Um, by now, a new book of hers appeared um, in May. It's a collection of, so of short stories. We are attempting to survive our time. Rings quite a bell, actually, doesn't it? Um, her homepage says that uh, these stories describe women and men wrestling with the lives they've been given. And this sounds just too familiar at the moment, doesn't it? Um, with this situation we are just been thrown into. Aya Kennedy also published a couple of children's books. It's um, four at the moment. Um, three have appeared uh, in, in German language, four in English. Uh, they are very, very funny, very empathi empathetic too, and it's fascinating to read in what a subtle way they also mirror the, um, say, large issues um, uh, that are in the, in the center of her writing altogether. They have a really beautiful and fanciful titles like Uncle Sean and Bill and their almost entirely unplanned adventure. And it's a great joy to say that uh, just in the German radio station SWR 2, um, these, all the three um, children's novels have been broadcast as radio plays just in these days. And I checked the media library like yesterday, they are still in and so you can still uh, watch them and, or rather listen to them. And I'd really recommend that to you. It's beautiful books and they are beautifully um, uh, translated, so it's a real pleasure. I could go on at a great length about all the different kinds of works, um, uh, all the different kinds of work um, A.L. Kennedy does, and about the many different prizes she's got. Um, I'll just put this in a very tiny nutshell. She's a dramatist for stage, radio, and TV. She's an essayist. She works for the BBC. Uh, she works for The Guardian. You will also have seen her regular columns for Süddeutsche Zeitung. Her prizes include the Costa Book Award and in Germany the Heinrich Heine Prize, uh, for, among others. And uh, now and then she even performs as a stand-up comedian. Now, as I said, she will read from unpublished texts, again a premiere we're having at the DAI. And I'm very eager to, you, to listen to you, A.L. Kennedy, and can just say a cordial welcome to you, to the DAI. Welcome, A.L. Kennedy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, very pleased to be here. Yeah. Ich freue mich. Guten Abend. Guten Abend. Vielen Dank. <laughs> so just again a short note for our um, audience. Uh, we will have a couple of uh, short um, conversation at the beginning. You're always welcome, of course, to send us your questions either via presse at dri-heidelberg.de or directly in the chat window uh, at YouTube and we can feed in your questions always. Um, and then Ayal Kennedy will read from a new text um, treated for starlings and then we'll have uh, another conversation. You're very welcome also to give in your questions and we will end with another short unpublished text. So, Miss Kennedy, we are meeting you in your house in Essex in the southeast of England and uh, normally um, normally I say with big quotation marks of course, you travel quite a lot. So uh, with the corona restrictions, um, your way of life must have uh, changed fundamentally. What's it like for you now? Well, um, I mean, my, my life is perfectly fine. Um, obviously, we've had huge numbers of dead people, lots of yeah. very, very sick people. My life is extremely pleasant in comparison to um, 
any of this or losing anyone. Um, I have half my life. Half my life is sitting at home, wishing I could sit at home more and just write. Um, so in a way, it's been very like um, the way I spend my time. Somebody uh, lends me a cabin in the woods in America in which to write. And effectively, I'm doing exactly now what I would do in America in a cabin in the woods, other than I cook, and it's not that somebody cooks for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, like what's... everyone else, yeah. <laughs> I'm making bread, like everybody else, I'm oh, just okay. making bread. Yeah. We're learning quite a lot of new things, and we also relearn things we once could do and just have forgotten to do or aren't accustomed to do anymore, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. What I didn't mention um, just before in the introduction was that um, you're also a, lec a lecturer at the University of Warwick. You teach uh, creative writing. And uh, I think that also for, for uh, your university, everything's gone online. So, so what's that like giving creative, especially creative writing and not just any course um, in a digital uh, platform? I think everyone finds it quite sympathetic. Uh, certainly the students seem more relaxed um, maybe everyone is more relaxed when they're not in a room with me. Um, I can't imagine. <laughs> could if you like. Uh, but um, I think it's sympathetic for a writer because they're saying something to one person in their own absence. So it's a very writerly interaction suddenly. And they're in their house, which is, you know, you, you write and then you're writing. To, you're supposed to go somewhere else. Um, so they seem to be very relaxed and we can talk for as long as, you know, there's no timetable. So if we need to talk for two hours, we can talk for two hours. So it's, it seemed to be um, much more pleasant, really. I guess much focus, as I, as I understood you, but also maybe more courage to go on with, with the text for the students. Because it's a bit more, um, seems or feels a bit more like an intimate relationship. I think, yeah. And, and really, it's very hard to talk to somebody about their work because you could talk about a paragraph unless it is perfect or even if it's perfect you could talk about why it's perfect you know it, an hour would maybe allow you to go through three or four hundred words so actually if you really wanted to teach somebody you would need them to not get incredibly tired by thinking that hard about individual words for hours and hours and hours um and and no timetable you know, has time for that. But you, you can begin to do that, um, you know, more than you can within a time. You know, I give them notes, always written notes that are very detailed. But the talking part, um, you know, it, it's it's normally truncated. And, and people seem more willing to talk about, you know, we're not machines that write, we're people and we have feelings. And um, right now people are worried. Uh, there's this cliche, which I think is a little bit the fault of German writers with big hats and bow ties and moustaches, and then they commit suicide. You know, there's this idea of um, capital R romantic people who are expend expending half their energy on suicide and self destruction and absinthe, and only the other half may be on their writing. And really, you know, being romantically, being miserable is never romantic and being romantically miserable does not help you to be uh, productive. So be, you know, being worried, it's very hard to be creative when you're, when you're worried. Um, so lots of people talking about being worried, you know, and, and, you know, sometimes you have to write if you earn your living as a writer when you're worried because being unable to pay your bills will make you more worried. <laughs> Um, but it's quite hard. You have to learn how to, you know, make this um, bubble within which you can be not worried. I think one of the um, the big changes in this Corona uh, time is um, the, the challenge to get more focus. So, um, as you said, we we have uh, we are in a bubble. Uh, many in much information from the from the outside uh, world uh, comes in. Um, nobody has been asked whether he or she wants to deal with that, with that kind of situation and quite apart from personal tragedies that uh, come along for, for many people, of course. Um, but we need to learn a lot of new things. Suddenly, 
we have the power also to learn them. But I, I would like to ask, um, uh, so many people talk about the new normal. Um, what is your view of this situation like new normal? Um, it sounds sometimes as if when, say, the, the main um, development of the crisis gets better again, people get healthier again, the infection rates slow down. Um, in what way do you think do we have to uh, adjust society? Or what could be new normal? I, I just have a sentence of Olga Tukarczyk in mind, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, who said that uh, she doesn't even want to go back to normal because what was normal before, in her um, uh, view, absolutely wasn't in terms of speed or pollution or uh, work life, for example. <laughs> Yeah, I th we, we've all had at least a time to think. And there are little things like in, in the UK, our newspapers relied on making us so worried that we would have to buy them the following day, which of course meant they had to manufacture anxiety and then fury. So they've torn apart um, society. Um, as a selling kind of a byproduct of a selling technique. And of course, if you actually are terrified and furious, you can't take any more. So everybody stopped reading the papers, which actually became fantastically relaxing. Um, so some weird little things have, have allowed us to sort of think, there's a lot of stuff being poured all over me every day, which is appalling, I don't need it. And it, it made me worse. I don't want to feel worse. And then there are huge things like, yes, you know, we don't want to go back to normal. Normal didn't work. Yeah. Um, everything has been magnified by this lens of Corona. Um, but the poor are always suffering. It's just that Corona makes them suffer so much they die. Yeah. Old people were really thrown away in this country already. Now they really have been thrown away. They've been left in homes uh, with do not resuscitate um, automatic on them if they become ill from anything, even if it's not COVID, they won't be tested. Um, people will be COVID patients moved from hospitals to their homes that had no infection. Um, it, it, we, we still don't know how horrible those casualties have been. Um, black people, we've always pretended that our racism was nicer. We had benevolent racism abroad and that we had none at home. We weren't as bad as America. We're just exactly the same as America. It's just our police don't have guns. And it's like, you know, it's harder to, to kill people if you don't have guns. Um, and suddenly people are saying, and, and obviously, you know, uh, black, Asian, Middle Eastern people in the UK are disproportionately dying because they're disproportionately poor and doing high exposure jobs where you meet lots of people, serve lots of people. Um, so it's, it's, it's highlighting the enormous things hmm. and the enormous lack of democracy. And what happens if you, you know, you put a clown in, in charge of uh, a whole circus full of slightly smaller clowns and you have that instead of a, a, a parliament. If you elevate excitement and edgy insanity instead of competence. Yeah, that just um, brings me to, sorry. We're going to go on. No, I think I was just going to moan, mm. oh. <laughs> weep. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, th th that brings me to the next question. Bef uh, question before we have uh, two questions from from the audience. Um, oh, as you were mentioning these different kinds of things that were simply utterly going wrong during the last couple of years, at the beginning when the coronavirus started to spread. Um, it felt a bit as if we were living in a dystopian novel with that uh, invisible kind of danger, the social distance, uh, distancing, the, the losses, the need in the overcrowded hospitals. And uh, dystopian novels always show us what, what's going wrong. So um, can, is, it, is it politics? Is it the, the caring for each other? I saw in your text uh, that caring is a big issue for you, the, an, another strengthening of compassion. Uh, that, that we see what where we where we weren't good at and in which fields we desperately need, need to get better again. Yeah, many fundamental ideas have have really been torn in half mm. by this insistence that the powerful can ignore reality. 
and be so powerful that they can demonstrate ignoring reality. You know, stand in front of film that shows them saying one thing and they can claim that they said another. It, it, it's this bizarre proof of power and it confuses and bewilders people. It's what uh, abusive partners do because people get hooked up in, but how can he be doing this? How can she be doing this? Um, and, and they can't think of how to escape. Yeah. So it's a good uh, dominating technique. But it means that things like compassion um, have been reformed to be lack of compassion. Um, and the necessity of compassion when you actually have something where everybody's hurting. And, pretty, you know, we've all had these little experiences lately where it's, oh, no, we need that stuff. The same in, in this country, you know, with the devaluing of the arts. What made us cry with joy in those first you know, that first tender week, those first two feet, horrible, tender, extraordinary locked in weeks, piece of music, piece of art, a photograph, somebody bringing you groceries, somebody even putting a leaflet through your door that offers to, to, to give you groceries that you don't even just the thought that there is somebody there who has thought I could help you or somebody phoning you, or suddenly you're phoning all these people you haven't yeah. been busy. All of this busyness, everybody, you know, myself included, we're all going, oh my God, my days are so full now, yeah. but they're not busy. And I used to be so busy, but I really wasn't achieving all that much. I have to stop that. And why on earth was I physically going to unnecessary places yeah. when I could have been sitting here doing the same thing and not being unecological and not using transport and just achieving and just working but also resting yeah. and, and this is something very interesting happening and also something quite comforting I think the, the decisions people start to make about um, how do I want to spend my time and uh, with whom do I want to spend my time that's uh, again um, a question of clarity and, and the focus I just see a question from uh, from a viewer um, a very politi political um, topic just uh, with this one. It's Michael or Michael Salak. Uh, Dear A.L. Kennedy, he asks, why do Boris Johnson and Donald Trump have so many followers? Oh, my goodness. Well, I mean, um, some of them don't exist, obviously. They, they, they exist in this online environment, which is arranged um, and manipulated. Um, so some of the idea, you know, they always exist on this idea of I represent the silent majority. And the idea that the silent people are a majority in favor of them statistically is never proven. They, they, they seem to get at most 35, 37 percent of people by endlessly repeating things that are so bizarre. They would have to be true because otherwise they would be crazy. And obviously, no, they're crazy. Um, they're saying things that make no sense at all, but they thrive in arenas where the news cycle is about outrage and excitement and, oh my God, look what he's done now. And oh my goodness, look what he's done now. Um, that's not what polit politics is supposed to be dull. It's like having an electrician and insisting that you constantly have to think, oh my God, I wonder what he's done to the wiring here. Oh my God, I wonder if I can turn the lights on. Nobody wants that. You want to turn the lights on and not have your house catch fire. Yeah. Politics is like that. It's basic maintenance. It's not glamour, glitz, Hollywood. But we've allowed journalism because the journalists got fired and there, there aren't you know, people with techniques and skills who can do in-depth reporting and there's no money to pay for the amount of time that takes. The only other thing you can offer people is glitz, glamour. Oh my God, is he really crazy? Will he kill us all tomorrow? Is he going to war? Or with Boris, it's like, oh my God. Actually, Boris is so bad that um, he, he literally is, is caused at causing waves of suicidal ideation every time he comes on TV because he so clearly has not a clue and can't get through the sentence um, and doesn't care and makes, you know, jokes about ventilators, Operation Last Gasp. You're making jokes about people dying on ventilators. There is something wrong with the interior of you. But he's in charge because he was exciting, because he's a laugh. 
Um, so it's all kind of terrible. And obviously, you know, um, we're becoming very polarized. People like me can say, oh, the busyness, it all didn't make sense. If you're stacking shelves or driving a van or working in a hospital, you're now in hell as opposed to just holding on. Or if you have no money or you're a refugee, you're wondering if you're going to starve to death, which is insane. We're a wealthy, allegedly First Nation country. People should not be hungry. People should not be homeless. We still haven't managed to take our homeless off the street. And that's, that's, that's an act of will. We have empty hotels everywhere. Why are they not in the empty hotels? Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's revealing lots of truths uh, and it's whether we'll push through. But I think the Black Lives Matter is the final straw because people have had enough time to think about everything and it's like, no, it's not okay to kneel on somebody's neck okay. for nearly nine minutes with other people watching and doing nothing while he cries for his mother. Yeah, no. I think we, we also see um, a change in, in expression of thought because, uh, as you mentioned, the, the followers are usually the, the loudest one, the ones who, who seize the, the most space and uh, the, the adversaries who try to keep up democracy and freedom of press and of speech um, tend to be so much more poli polite and so much more quiet also in Germany. And I think this is also a task uh, for many others to lift their voices and express themselves very, very clearly. And I think the wise decision that you got from Black Lives Matter, because I think the black community is very aware that if there's a lot of violence, they'll just be murdered. Yeah. You know, there's a real pressure and discipline to be as non-violent as possible. Yeah. And that makes everything sustainable and workable and and you know, horribly dangerous and amazing courage to, to, to go when you know that somebody could just shoot you for being there. Um, but that, that absolutely is, is, is a huge, you know, smart, beautiful change. Yeah. And seems a, a sustainable one. With yeah, the because... the going on worldwide now. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, all of the strange MAGA hat wearing people get their um, Boogaloo Civil War. Isn't that nice? They have a cute name for Civil War. Yeah. Uh. We have another question from uh, Rainer Kalb. Um, it's about um, Corona in uh, in the UK, which is uh, which struck the, the country much more than, for example, in Germany. We were really lucky with this, and uh, uh, the number of dead in the UK at the moment is even much higher than in Italy, uh, but much less uh, media coverage at the same uh, time. And you mentioned uh, in one of the conversations we had before that uh, that number of dead. <clears throat> sorry, even uh, um, uh, succeeds the, the number of dead um, by the Second World War. So the question is, um, how are you dealing with these huge changes your country is experiencing um, at the moment? Um, how does this affect your creativity? Do you need uh, either a free mind or a solution-focused mind for writing good stuff? That's a wonderful but large question. Um... Yes, I mean, the country is quiet, partly because the sensible people are trying to not give each other diseases. And, you know, the level of fury should not be underestimated. And the idea that a government minister <laughs> would be closely connected to somebody. I mean, multiple people have broken quarantine in government. Uh, Boris Johnson's sister, Boris Johnson's special advisor. Um, multiple times just seriously you know i couldn't go to my mother's funeral and you were going on pleasure trips because you can um prince charles going to balmoral and suddenly there's covid in balmoral Ooh, don't think that we're not furious um but it will take time but oddly enough i was in america starting a novel and things in america this is back um, october november and I, you know, I haven't written a novel for a while and I'm in this, you know, terrible situation and the impeachment, you know, that, that isn't going to, it's, it's not a strategy that's going to work and how, how do we maintain any kind of democracy and Putin seems very powerful and Bolsonaro and all of this stuff. 
and I'm sitting there keeping an audio diary of writing a novel. Sorry, this is a long answer. But I, I'm actually literally talking into this audio diary, trying to start saying, well, why, why am I doing this instead of um, becoming a politician or um, giving my whole life to protest instead of sometimes protest? Or, you know, why art? And I'd already had that conversation. It's like, because that's what I do, you know, that's the thing that I do best. And it changes the interior of people at such depth and with such effective power that it's always what people ban. If you look at what dictators ban and destroy immediately, it's immediately the stuff that changes people for the better and uh, promotes em empathy. And this is what I produce. Um, so, so when COVID happened, it's like, now I've already had this conversation and I'm now in a country where everybody's thinking, that poem got me through, that song got me through, that online concert got me through, that beauty that a stranger made, not knowing I would need it, but in the hope that there would be somebody for whom it would be useful, that got me through a terrible day that I might not have survived, I might have just killed myself. And we have so much suicide in this country, we're like, East Germany now. Um, so, yeah, I'd already thought, no, I do what I do because it's a useful thing to do. And I probably should have said more often that it's a useful and essential thing to do. Um, and I just need to always think, what more can I do with this thing that I'm good at? And would you tell us, as you were just mentioning poems or books that got us through, um, would you tell us some of, uh, some, some of the poems or novels that get you through? Such times. They go well. Uh, Ste Stefan Schweig. Stefan Schweig. He's oh. he's very wonderful. Um, Robert Louis Stevenson actually. Um, I've loved Robert Louis Stevenson since I was a child. Obviously, he wrote for children, but his adult writing I've always loved. And somehow, in lockdown, being able to travel, reading a Scottish writer who hated the British Empire, who saw it for what it was while it was at its height, who traveled all over the world. I've been everywhere he went apart from Samoa where he died um, and who helped people and who, who would sit with anybody and talk with them and who could speak foreign languages. He was a completely European man, a uh, man of the world. Um, and sort of going through his kind of travel of travelogues was kind of wonderful. In in a way, it was like it was as good as traveling. And he 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 wrote a short story called Will of the Mill, which is just about this man who always wants to travel. And he lives in this um, inn, so the world comes to him, and he never does go anywhere. He just meets people from everywhere and is enriched by them. And then at the end of his life, another visitor comes and he doesn't know who it is, but he does know who it is. And there's this wonderful line, and I swear to God, I, this I haven't read recently. His visitor, he says, yeah, but who are you? And his visitor says, I am a natural law. And, and he walks away with death. And it's just another visitor. And, and now finally he's going on a journey. Um, just a very kind death in a time of very unkind death. Um, but that sense of the world also being able to come to you, particularly when we have technology. You know, if this had happened 20 years ago when we had no technology, oh my Lord, can you imagine? <laughs> we have uh, another question on the UK before we could go on to, to read a part of your new story. It's a question of Frau Braun, and she's asking, um, how are those enormous problems in your society, in what way are the enormous problems in your society accelerated by the crisis? How are people dealing with each other? And is the town and the streets getting rougher or friendlier at the moment? Oh, definitely friendlier. Everybody is sort of saying, uh, even in London, which is not a smiling place, I mean, people are waiting for it to change back to normal 
which is just to do with people being very stressed and tired. But now everybody's saying, when nobody smiled, people are smiling. Where people smiled, we're now having conversations. The passing chats are now a little bit longer. And in the absence of uh, government, we know that but, but, you know they're incompetent and incapable and full of learned helplessness. And our newspapers tell us, oh, you can't do anything. Oh my God, there's this terrible thing wrong and there's no solution. British people organized massive networks of um, self-help help organizations, put them online, made them accessible pretty much within the first week. I mean, they did everything the government should have done. Um, you know, I, I, I was in touch and I'm still in touch and raising money and doing things for, you know, this little group that had already raised funds, made a van to feed the homeless people in Glasgow through the winter. Suddenly in January, there's basically one man and some people he got together. He just said, well, well, we still have to feed them because other people are stopping. I just, I need, I need uh, protection equipment for myself and my staff and for them. I need hygiene kits for them. And if I ever have spare food, I'll just feed everybody that needs food. So now he's gone from doing one wonderful thing to giving hot meals to elderly care facilities. If anybody in the community lets him know that somebody is at home and doesn't have a meal, he gives them a meal. His whole thing is, if you need food and I have food, you will have food. Um, another guy, again, a Scottish guy, um, the Islamic, you know, son, son of immigrants, just a guy. He said, I'm going to get PPE. I'm going to get whatever I can get, gloves, face masks, glasses, whatever. My mother says to me, my neighbor's crying because her daughter's a teacher. She has to keep going into schools to feed the children who have to come to school because it's the only hot food they get in the day. So one problem causes another problem causes another problem. She has no protection. She's terrified. She has to visit their homes if they don't turn up. So I get in touch with this guy and I say, would you provide protection for a, t a teacher? I know you only do it for nurses or could you just straight back she's a frontline worker what do you need and it's just that people who understand life and death is important and who just are on it yeah. um you know a one friend of mine that i knew from london she just gone to ireland just organized herself and first week of their lockdown she literally coordinated a network of 6,000 volunteer organizations. <laughs> one woman. Wow. It's definitely, one. More, than, definitely yeah. more than one silver line, lining at the horizon, isn't it? You know, I mean, people are, are discovering they can do stuff. Yeah. Um, and by that themselves. Sometimes, and by yeah. themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And that people will help. That's a great outcome. Yeah. You know, and at the moment, you know, last, last week, I'm not going to demonstrations just now because I'm a little bit old for, for getting COVID. Um, but my little village, which is in Essex, which is traditionally quite right wing, we had a, somebody else who also arranged the volunteers. He arranged the Black Lives Matter demonstration. We now do this every week. We stand on our doorsteps with signs and whoever walks past, people we don't necessarily know, but they're probably neighbors and we sort of say hi. People either ignore us or the majority of people go, oh, great, is this next week as well? Okay, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. Or cars driving past, waving, you know, banging on their horns. And it's it's um, it's an antidote to our media, which are yeah. all, you're alone and nobody knows how to do anything anymore. Yeah, and a clear decision everyone can make on what's re relevant and what isn't, or what's important and what, what isn't, also for the future on a societal level. Yeah, it's 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 love. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Is it loving is this thing loving a loving thing or is it not a loving thing? Yeah. If it's not a loving thing, it cannot be tolerated. If yeah. it is a loving thing, it must be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. And if that's the bottom line, I don't care what religion you are or what philosophy yeah. or what politics, if that's the bottom line, fewer people die 
and people do die and we all will die so we have to make things as nice as possible because we're all doomed so don't we don't need more doom and having said that would you read us from your new short story treated for starlings okay um this is this is a section from the middle of a magazine story uh, called Treat it, Treated for Starlings. It will explain this odd, it's an odd phrase even in English, treated for starlings, like you would be treated for a disease. Um, but, but way back um, when I first went to Glasgow, when they were cleaning the buildings and removing birds, uh, you would be treated for starlings, which would be, we'll stop 50,000 starlings being in your building and being crazy. Um, so I'll just read a little bit. This is from the middle of the story, and a, a woman is going for a, a walk, and you'll see in my glasses that I'm reading it on screen. I certainly have not memorized it, but that seemed to be the best way to do this with a, with a computer. So a um, lady called Anne, who is thinking about her life in the first two, three weeks of lockdown, and I wrote this over the course of, of week one, well, week two of, of lockdown, uh, talking about life with her husband at home, and then we'll move on. On the house schedule, they mark the daily fall of darkness for the week. They make observations of the night sky. Her husband even started a list of targets, Venus, satellites, meteor showers pink moon between opaled clouds. It's lost somewhere, so they can't cross things off anymore. After standing in the echoes of the empty street, looking up, looking up, they watch favorite films. Nothing untested that might be stressful, only trustworthy old companions. Her husband turns on foreign language subtitles for stimulation and added value. He's a man who likes to make improvements. Anne has only retained random pieces of other countries' swear words. While the plots unfurl, she has her sewing with her masks. If the dramas get too dramatic, her output soars. She has a low tolerance for emotion and is aware that she and her husband are washing away the enjoyment from movies that once were her friends. Cary Grant is becoming pointless. Each performer she loves is suddenly trying too hard. Anne has decided she'll never suggest either Bogart or Bacall. She's keeping them safely away from all this. So I don't know when I'll see them again. Last night, Anne nominated a French film she has always pretended to like because everyone talked about it when she was a student. Her husband bought it for her three or four Christmases ago and she hooked it out from a dustless shelf in a perfectly organized cupboard. It was still sealed in its unecological cellophane, which isn't necessary because why would you wrap up a CD as if it were biscuits and might go stale? We need biscuits. No, we don't need biscuits. They would make us fat. We need more biscuits for the food bank and for Mrs. Archer. Make her smile. What kind of life needs a packet of biscuits makes you smile. The film was terrible, truly awful. All this time, 30 years, she's been saying it's a favorite. It was meant to be proof that Anne is fully functional, a going concern. Any adult should be able to have a favorite French film. She's a person and has a right to access culture. Tribes at the end of their tether survive if they can save their elders and their culture. We've run clear out off our tether, but we're all supposed to hate and pity both. Anne's walks are supposed to be restoring, so she tries to remember anything she likes. Buster Keaton, the films of Buster Keaton. She shares him with the unknown people who also enjoy Keaton and therefore must be like her, and potentially friends. It's good to feel that unknown people might be on your side. But then I screw it up. I pretend to be an unknown person, and nothing I say that I'm fond of is a good fit. All this time, 
it is about 30 years, she's been happily claiming a movie that's proof she's a bit off her head. Pretentious, lying, unimpressive, weak, and therefore like the known and unknown people who aren't helpful. Halfway through watching the French abomination, they were both on their phones. Distractions have to be exceptional to stop them checking for the next disasters. Again and again and again and again. And didn't admit she'd been wrong, made a wrong choice. I was embarrassed. None of her character flaws are dramatic, but they add up to someone she can't like. Embarrassment seemed a disgustingly petty emotion to entertain in the situation. Her husband didn't say a thing about it, which was probably kind of him. Kind man. At the moment, he spends an hour each morning doing press-ups and sit-ups, timed rests and repetitions. He aims to meet the standards of the United States, United States Marine Corps Physical Fitness Test, which is something he came across online. Goals are useful. The physical fitness test has a distance running component, but he beats up and down their stairs to fulfill it rather than go outside. He has noticed that running past people alarms them. He is considerate like that. And Anne has her long, careful walks. They are the equivalent of several biscuits. Exercise supports both health and emotional resilience. She is rounding the last of the wood and heading back towards the water when the kestrel stops her. It's nailed in the sky with this kind of authority over her route. Reed tops and branches are swinging. Long grasses are being pushed down into roiling waves, but the bird is still. Its whole body is watching, an absolute. Then it throws itself out of the air, drops hard. Anne's stomach lurches with fresh vertigo or anxiety or joy or triumph or some other word for some other emotion. When the kestrel lifts again and turns, its wings gleam almost red. Then it flies from her, dipping its head and tearing at a small shape held in one claw. She is glad we all have to eat. But also she feels the touch of something hard at the back of her neck, quick and then gone. And probably she is crying. That seems fairly certain. Fourth time today various reasons. She jog trots to the point where the path makes a kind of shrug and rejoins the barn, looking out across the wet skin of the mud flats, the bones of abandoned boats worn to needle points. Her phone always has reception here, exactly here, where she stands and calls Bill, looks over the creek at that church tower and calls Bill. She is aware this is a remarkably stupid idea. When you're trying to survive, though, you do whatever's necessary. Talking is necessary. And he answers before she expects it and kicks at her pulse. This is her name, but with another taste. The one that he adds. I was waiting. This is the sound of how long he's lived and whether he is smiling. She feels he might be smiling. Am I late? You sound sleepy. Did I wake you up? Am I late, though? Maybe. Maybe you're late. Not maybe I'm sleepy. I mean, I don't know the time. I lost my watch somewhere. Are you okay? Everyone keeps asking everyone if they're okay. She's leaning her back to the wind, his voice held in the shelter of both hands. Are you? Okay. I'm not bad. She came five or six miles out to do this, and now all she's got is small talk. I'm... It's very beautiful out here. But the details of her walk fragment, and she can't describe them. She might almost have dreamed the journey and would still be at home, where she can't talk. With so much weather going on, it's not easy to tell, but Anne believes she hears his breath become a sigh. If they were resting, please, just at peace together, please, on the bed, hip against hip, 
then a sigh would shift their touch in closer. I do love the people I love. You're meant to do that. You're meant to follow along behind that and be protected because you are doing what is right. Apparently, she is sobbing. Anne pulls out a tissue and wipes her eyes, her nose, this making her gloves condemned things that she will throw directly into the wash, and this also making the tissue a terrible object. It's very tiring, the essential constant weariness. I want a day when one thing that matters gets better instead of worse, instead of broken, instead of vandalized. A proper cry is supposed to do you good. And clears her throat. You can't say I'm not a trier. But before she can speak, he starts. My dad used to tell me when someone was ill and he didn't know the details. Oh, she's being treated for starlings. He's under the doctor, treated for starlings. It was his joke. I was only wee and thought it was like mumps or chicken pox. A chicken is a bird. I thought you could catch starlings. He pauses to let her join in, but she's looking at the red inside her eyelids and failing to picture his face. She holds on to the story. In the end, I found out it was an architectural thing, a city corporation thing. They had too many starlings, so they got rid of them from the buildings. I don't know if that meant clearing nests and filling gaps or installing thing, nets and spikes and such. I hope it was only that. You'd have your office block or your tenement treated for starlings, that was the term. He stops again and lets him. She's imagining red sandstone and high narrow windows and sunsets boiling at the foot of the Byers Road. Glasgow, the city of arts and crafts. Every evening waking what's left of the stained glass and porches. When there's trouble, you want to go home or you want to know that home is still all right. And home can be the place where you first were content. It can be the place that gave you people you could love. For years, I thought starlings was the worst thing you could catch. He's getting difficult to hear. Dad got the mesothelioma from his work. Mum got it from his jacket and from carrying his shirt and overalls to the wash. And tells him, I miss you. She only ever seems to say that when he's already preoccupied. She has bad timing. Up in the co-op, where they all dance, dance, to keep their six-foot perimeters intact, these taut sections of air, she feels other shoppers notice her rhythms off. She says, I remember the stars. That isn't a lie. Once during her first year in Glasgow, she'd been slightly lost and had made for Central Station to start again. You can always start again from a known fixed point. She had been heading along Broomilaw, thought she was looking up at nothing but the girders and complications of the railway bridge, and then the mass of birds had risen from it as if they'd been conjured from nowhere and were one thinking twisting thing that reached out and flexed across the width of the skyline and made the noise of waterfalls. They blurred and flowed and scattered and then compacted, hung there. I don't know. It looked like a bad thing bound to happen. It looked like now. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much, A. Kennedy, for this beautiful piece of your new story, it's Treated for Starlings. It's a very sensitive story that explores all the kinds of emotions, sensations, thoughts um, that follow us, that develop themselves in us during this lockdown time. It'll be published in the Esquire um, in the month, during the month of June, right? Yes, um, it's sort of, it, it's kind of available, but of course it's very difficult to get a copy of UK mm. Esquire <laughs> or any other magazine. Maybe so in, in, yeah, in theory, I think there's a, there's at least one 
internet company that will just send it to your house. But it's uh, mm. and it's uh, an issue which is all uh, short stories and writing. Yeah, we'll try to find it. <laughs> Um, I, I wonder um, what the absence of being able to touch each other will change in the long run, or whether it will be counterbalanced by more friendliness, more caring for each other, or also by looking much more into each other's eyes, since some people just are a bit afraid to talk to each other in the streets and make uh, more distances but you look more closely into each other's eyes. Do you, what do you think will change? I mean, in the end, it's maybe more of a question for a psychologist, but what, what do you think about the touching? Yeah. The of touching? I don't know. It's, it's interesting. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, talking to this uh, Frenchman and he was going, well, uh, Paris, you know, won't exist. Um, French people touch each other. And, um, but it will never happen again. Mm -hmm. And of course, in 19... 17, 1918, we had an epidemic when we knew we couldn't touch each other yeah. um, and we will have stopped touching each other and obviously we started again. Um, we're, we're primates, we touch each other. Um, but it's, it's interesting that we also do human things that uh, apes and monkeys don't do. We, we smile and we laugh. We do these things because you then you can kind of connect with somebody without touching them because not everybody wants you to touch them or you might not want to touch them. Um, and with, you know, we have what they didn't have in 1917, 1918, which is we, you know, we can see each other. We can look in, uh, at each other and um, to see somebody's face that you love, it, it produces oxytocin that you, in the same way that a hug does. So we're, we're much luckier, but lots of people that I've, you know, I've been talking to online are saying, this is quite confessional, isn't it? You'd be talking to people a lot about things that are quite real, I think, because of the situation and because you're at home and you feel safe. And it's almost as if the strange bit that was missing from online, online, it's very, it's like being in a car. You can be very aggressive. You can drive in a way you would never walk because you feel defended and you can shout and barge at people. And the internet was quite like being in your car and shouting and disagreeing and uh, craziness. And suddenly the internet is, I love you, I miss you. Um, tell me about your spiritual growth. Uh, <laughs> what have you been studying? <laughs> Which languages have you learned? You know, it's, it's suddenly, uh, or people, uh, I remember when a uh, global citizen uh, did, uh, you know, together at home, where people kind of ran, the, everybody around the world who had internet access could be at this huge concert, and somebody just sang their own version of I Want to Hold Your Hand, the Beatles song. Mm. And this was beginning of lockdown, I was just weeping uncontrollably at an acoustic, not very good version of a person saying that they want to do something that's impossible. Yeah at the moment. Um, so hopefully we, we will appreciate um, things more. But I, you know, I always remember a friend of mine dived off, I don't know why, in Spain, into a river, but near a, a waterfall. And he got sucked back into the waterfall. And that circular sort of whirlpool of it's like a, a horizontal whirlpool oh, instead of a vertical okay. one. Yeah. And you can die, you can just be trapped. And he fought and fought and fought and fought to get out. Um, and he emerged, you know, obviously he's telling me the story so he didn't die. He had swam further up the river and got to the shallows and you know, struggled to his feet. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to take anything for granted again. I will love people. Everything will be wonderful. I will never forget that life is precious. And immediately, he noticed that um, Spanish schoolgirls were laughing at him because the waterfall had sucked his swimming trunks off. So he's standing there naked and immediately, <laughs> what, were, what were all those spiritual decisions you had come to? <laughs> Quite dynamic. <laughs> So okay. how long we remember things? I mean, you know, we, we had the terrible things that went on uh, in 
World War II, and then we made lots of decisions about human rights law and all kinds of things. I mean, sensible people realize we're going to make lots of sensible decisions, and, and we'll write them down, and we'll, we'll put in systems. And it, it's taken three generations to decide, yeah, but I personally have, have no memory of um, it not being fun to have a bomb fall on my house. Mm. So why don't we take the laws against that away? Um, because I want to sell you bombs and uh, it's important I should have money. Yeah. And maybe your house will be on fire, but you know, it's not my house. We were so, talking, yeah. sorry. No, 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 no problem. <laughs> we were talking about your writing um, at the beginning of the conversation and um, we see that during this Corona time, uh, the public discourse is dominated on one hand by um, scientific conversations and language. We, we, we all learn incredibly, um, well, strange words, which, are, which we, we didn't use beforehand. Like in German, you say Infektionskette. Well, I think in English it's chain of infection or some mm. infection rate and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, we, we still have this, well, populism movement and fake news and also political language that deals and plays also with uh, fright, for example. So um, you as, as a writer, so what is the big power of uh, liter literature and of fiction exactly now in contrast to the, say, seemingly, seemingly objective language of, of the sciences? Well, the, the, the scientists are, are saying, um, you know, sensible fact-based things and when they make statements, I mean, you know, you have a scientist in charge. Mm. We have a potato on a stick mm. with some kind of woolen arrangement on its head. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's a huge difference. Um, you, you know, Angela, Angela Merkel can make sentences mm. that contain meaning and she meant to give that meaning and she made sure it was in the sentence because it was important for you to have that information so that your grandmother doesn't die. Um, it certainly underlined that careful use of language is a power in the world um, and it takes overwhelming repetition of things that are not careful and don't add up to begin to push back against factual information. Um, if, if I just may, may add that, what I find quite interesting and also in a way comforting is how often we hear the, the sentence, I don't know, or I don't know mm. yet by scientists. Oh. And that's something I was really grateful. Like somebody said, no, this was the kind of shortened information. Uh, it's much more complex or we, don't, we just don't know yet. And I find that a very good well, counter action actually to, um, to a language that has discovered into very emotionalized way during the last couple of years and very scandalized also, also in the media. Yeah, I mean, you're seeing weak people being represented by other weak people um, who have to be loud, who have to be flashy, who can never admit they don't know, who can never admit that anybody knows more than they do. Um, and you're, you're seeing them crash. You know, um, but yeah, I don't know is, is, is a wonderful answer if you don't know, <laughs> for God's sake. Yeah. Do you know how to take out my kidneys? <laughs> but you don't hear it so often that, that somebody yeah. has the, the courage to say, I don't know. No, and it, and it yeah. really is a matter of courage. You know, if you're yeah. a strong person, you can say, I don't know, but I'll find out. Mm. Or I don't know, and it's mm. not my job to know, but I'll make sure that someone will tell you. And we have people who know how to do nothing and want to make sure that nobody is above them. So we're having to be pushed into the ground to make us lower than people who can't do anything and have serious mental, emotional difficulties that make them genuinely dangerous. And some of whom are genuinely cruel. And it's very difficult to not be better than a cruel person, which is why, as you said, um, Boris Johnson, although he loves to compare himself to Winston Churchill, who was also an alcoholic, they have this in common. But yeah, he's killed more people, more civilians now yeah. than the Luftwaffe, yeah. which I seem to recall was not working for Winston Churchill. Yeah. And <laughs> you mentioned... Still, they, you know, and you mentioned that... 
No, I just, you know, they're waving all of their little flags. Yeah. Uh, it's like, really? You do realize that you're on the other side now? <laughs> you mentioned that, uh, astonishingly, uh, Bryce Johnson had the time to write a novel. Yes. It, it, in fact, even that sentence has a lot more astonishment in it than yeah, you would imagine. And we, we must give out a warning, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, it is quite a while ago that he wrote this novel, um, okay. although even quite recently he was allegedly writing another book, mm -hmm. um, an alleged book and alleged writing. It, no nouns or verbs or adjectives, if you throw them at him, they don't fit because he warps reality so allegedly writing but not in the sense of writing yeah. he was writing a book in the sense of it's not a book as you would understand a book which you might say was a novel although only if you completely reversed what you thought about novels <laughs> not a surprise that it's bad but astonishingly beneath anything you would expect yeah. Um, so yes, I, I now teach um, students because you, you can scan pages of it and, and go through it with them. I would never make anyone read it in its entirety. Um, uh, yeah, what not to do? Probably. Absolutely, every single thing you can do wrong, plus the unusual thing, which is don't make it plain that you hate human beings and find them. Um, particularly distasteful if they're female, old, not white, um, not a, a former pupil of Eton. I mean, basically, it's, a, it's, it's a, if somebody had read it before he, you know, became uh, a person with any power at all, they would just have said, well, no, this is a huge kind of Rorschach test mm. for, um, you know, it's very violent. It's, obviously, it's racist, sexist, bigoted, fantastically stupid. Um, what would expect it? <laughs> lazy <they're> getting... <laughs> in the execution. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know as as a, but then you know Philip Pullman and a whole load of writers way way back uh, you know did a public letter to say look we write fiction, um, and on behalf of people who write fiction, y your lying isn't even any good. Right. It's, it's awful which is why it has to be so loud and repetitive mm. because it, it isn't convincing. But if you once make somebody believe it, because realizing that you've been wrong would make you very stupid. And this is, you know, this awful psychological yeah. uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Once they've got you, you can't turn around without having this awful psychic crash. And they appeal to people who have nothing going for them. And they give them this horrible little thing they can cling to and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's really, I, I, I hate to think what will happen when the crash comes yeah. and they, you, people have to realize um, we, 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 we kind of open the country to, to a sociopath. Yeah. That's a, a very, very big field, but I'd like to come, to come back to your students um, you just mentioned. Um, you write on, on your website, um, for your students who really want to write in the sense of writing, that um, gaining one's own voice is an essential step if somebody wants to start writing. So how do you encourage them or help them to find their own voice? I mean, oh, this is goodness. actually a, a topic for, for everybody, especially in, in this time. Oh, it's deeply political. Uh, it's always unhealthy in uh, any country where you don't, you're not hearing from everybody where that, you know, that United Nations human right of expressing yourself, that should be on TV, it should be in films, it should be in short stories, it should be in novels. Um, that becomes very difficult because you, you don't exist if you're not on TV. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're, you know, <laughs> it's a horrible kind of thing that you do to people because your voice is such an inherent thing. Mm. It's so intimate. And basically, I'm sitting there saying, um, the future of the world is in your hands. If you don't write person-like people that other people can enter into so that they learn empathy and exercise their imagination in a way that is empathetic and have that intimacy with someone other than themselves, society will fail. So no pressure. 
But when we're talking about all of the technical things, you are serving humanity in depth. This is not nothing that you're doing. So you have to do it as well as possible. It's not about you. It's about serving this thing. Um, technically, it's not about you. Um, my writing is not about me. It's about the story that came to me to be expressed, and then I hand it on to you in the best way I possibly can. If it's about me, it's like listening to an egomaniac in the pub mm. tell you a story, and you it's like listening to Trump. He never tells you anything except stuff about him. Um, and it's awful. It's distasteful always. So you, you're trying to be translucent, which is odd when you come into writing at first, because it, it feels really exciting and very much about you. It is very much about you because it's your voice and that doesn't exist with anyone else. Um, but the story that you tell, if you serve that completely and you just work on making that as perfectly expressed as you possibly can, that automatically means you make your voice the voice it has to be to be able to tell that story. And when you tell the next story, your voice is a little bit more ready to tell that story. And then that story teaches your voice to tell the next story. And it, it means everything becomes very positive and grows, but it's, it's, it's a real devotion, devotion to having a purpose. And just, you know, if you want to say something, make sure you know what it is you want to say. Most people kind of brush that bit. They kind of know what they sort of want to say, and you kind of can't sort of write something because all the reader does is stare at it and see that it's not okay. Um, if you know what you want to say, and you know which bit of it you want to say now, all you have to do is try and say it as much as possible. And from that, all of the grammar, the punctuation, the technical things that you have different technical words for, if it comes from, I know what I want to say, and I know what I want to say of it now. And now I'm going to try and say it the best possible way I can so that it's musical and it's rhythmical and it's clear, clear, clear. Mm. And you can be there instead of me. I step out of the way so that you can be there. I imagine it first and I get it all. It's like the chambermaid goes into the beautiful hotel room and you're so tired and you've been on this awful long journey, but you finally get to the hotel and the chambermaid has done everything and everything is beautiful and the bed is perfect and the bathroom is wonderful and the hot water is great and everything is clean and there's fruit and you lie on the bed and you say, oh God, I miss hotels. You know, you lie on the bed <laughs> and it's just, oh, this is perfect. I feel better now. It's because, but the chambermaid isn't still there. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone somewhere else doing making some other hotel room so it's you know it, it's kind of supposed to be thankless the, the the point where you feel better is when you finished it nobody else is ready yet but you kind of know that it's okay and you learned something and you you know you don't necessarily even know what you've learned but with that sort of devotion and, they, and underlying that you can't be afraid there are so many people who can't speak because they have no current desire to, or they're oppressed, or their education has been, you know, withheld from them, or they're in prison, or they're not well, or they're so downtrodden that they have no space to speak. If you can speak, it's kind of completely an indulgence to be afraid to speak when no one is stopping you. You, you have to not be afraid. Um, because the fear comes out in the writing, the nervousness and the hiding and the, oh, I won't quite say it because then they'll know what I mean. So I know they want to know what you mean. They're readers, they're nice. They came to hear you because they love hearing you. Now more than ever, you know, you absolutely know the people crying at home because they found that poem and then it was a little bit okay. Or the people who, you know, somebody died and something got them through the worst possible thing that could happen. Even if it's just, you know, people putting on Twitter, just bothering to put words, I am sorry for your loss, may their memory be a blessing, whatever it is. Words aren't nothing. They, they aren't powerless. But all the nice people kind of go, oh, no, no, only the nasty people can do powerful things with words. No. 
they have to because all of the other words are doing nice things mm. and that's what you're part of and it's you know what would be frightening you get to be the only thing that you can be perfectly which is you saying stories that somehow are part of you so they they occur to you to be expressed they come to you to be expressed and then maybe you're there the next time a disaster happens to that reader and it's not just oh this is fun and fun is nice it's ah no i'm alive i'm okay or oh i'm reading this and i know that they loved it oh she always loved this poem oh i can hear her voice oh i can hear his voice that's the thank you very much for for this it was wonderful to listen to you just during the last these last couple of minutes especially um it's also actually the experience of beauty uh, beauty is something that turns up very often in your in your writing also beauty in nature and nature itself we had the uh, the image of the kestrel this in deutsch turm of deutsch turmfalke turmfalke Oh, Tom! Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. And this was an well, image of, of beauty, of autonomy also. Um, is beauty um, a power for you? Maybe an encouragement also? Oh, yes. Um, which is why it's so important to, you know, a, a, allow beauty to be shared around. You know, we, we, we all know, you know, if you want to uh, make a population depressed, you, you put them in terrible buildings and you put them in rooms that are a little bit too small and, and the streets are shabby. Um, and you know where the nice people live because there are gardens and there are flowers and there are, everything about that environment says we think you're precious and you should be having a good time just when you're walking around. And when you look anywhere, there should be something to please you. Um, that's always saying somewhere, you, you know, reality loves you. And so many people, you know, living in uh, refugee camps and nothing they can look at makes them feel that they're loved or that mm. their, their life is worth it. It's very dispiriting. Um, so beauty is hugely, hugely powerful. Or, or just, you know, I used to do, I used to do workshops when I started um, writing. Um, I wasn't making any money with the writing. Um, so I did art workshops, drama workshops, all kinds of workshops, um, but only with people with um, uh, illnesses, mental illnesses, physical illnesses, um, learning disabilities, all kinds of things. And I accidentally, I had a time left at the end of the session. And I accidentally, with uh, people with Down syndrome, I don't know what that is in German. Um, Tanzschule, uh, Tanzsaal, probably. Yeah. So with, yeah. you know, um, a, li a little bit of um, l learning disability. Yeah. Um, and we just made a circle. And these people, you know, they look different. They get shouted at, they get shoved, they get abused just for being who they are. Um, very often unhappy things in their lives. And we just made a circle and, and we took it in turns to stand in the middle of the circle. And the rest of the circle just applauded and cheered and said, shouted their name, you know, as if they were a movie star. Just such a simple, simple thing. And all of them, you know, because the truth is, this has never happened in their life ever. There's never been applause for them. Mm. There's never been people shouting their name with joy. Um, and beauty is, is, is like that, you know, whatever the beauty happens to be, you know, uh, people have different tastes. But it's, it's very important that we're constantly thinking, do our cities say that everybody is loved and cared for and should have access to, you know, free art galleries, few free museums, uh, good, pleasant, airy schools for all the children, parks, gardens, uh, public art. Does it have all to do with, things. sorry. No, no, no. Does it have to do with dignity? giving the access to beauty to someone? Sure, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. And if you're trying to hold on to your dignity, so often that's making something beautiful or, or carrying some little beautiful thing 
with you mm. as a kind. It's 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 a proof, sort of proof of humanity. Mm. Obviously, it also helps um, delinquents getting back to well to a better life and finding a better life again. Um, if you give them the, the the chance to experience beauty in all kinds of things, be it a garden or be it um, a novel or even a Shakespeare tragedy, uh, tragedy, because it gets you in connection again. And, and yeah, like, like a focus, a broader horizon again. Absolutely, and it's um, it's it's so important that people should be surrounded by everything possible so they find their thing. Mm. Because you you don't know it might be ballet, and you know that could totally change it. Everybody, I think, who's who's fortunate. I mean, I, I remember talking to this guy who was a, a, a rap star and he came from a young black guy, so statistically very likely to get killed in street violence, statistically certain to get uh, abuse of some kind from the police, um, lived in a, a housing estate, so very few oper uh, opportunities. And he was narrating that he got involved with an art project that involved singing, he was in this uh, choir. And he just described going, going to the theater, going to the South Bank Art Center, and going in the back door. And he just had this smile that I totally knew the smile, that he didn't go in the door that the public go in. He went around the back. And he went in the door that the people who do things and make things, mm. who are the special people, went mm. in. And it changed his life. And he's this amazing, he's this little tiny mousy guy. And I've seen video of him on stage. And on stage, he's like this extraordinary, sexy, melodious, incredible uh, Timbo. This guy is called Timbo. Um, and that was his thing. He just needed to sing. Mm. And now he isn't going to die. He isn't going to be in a gang. He's, yeah. You know, uh, it just, so you just need to give. Yeah. And something Somebody. large came into existence with this. Yeah, yeah, you know, and that, you know, that makes his parents happier, that makes his community happier, that makes his friends happier. Mm -hmm. All these ripples happen. Mm -hmm. And if you get, you know, yeah. 10 people out of 100 people, those ripples probably touch everybody in the 100. And then they feel a little bit, you know, it's like smiling. Instead of growling, if you smile at everybody you meet going to the shops. Positive no, I can't. contagion. I, yeah, well, now, yes, it's yeah. a nice contagion. Obviously, mm, yeah. if I smile now, yeah. I'm in a mask. Um, yeah. So so I wave mm. now. Yeah. Just waving at everybody. Yeah. Smiling with your eyes also. Um, yeah. In the other Which is the we, <laughs> that's the interesting thing. Fake smiles don't work now. Yes, absolutely. It has to because be a Duchenne smile. And the micromimics will tell. Absolutely. <laughs> It has to be a proper Duchenne yeah. smile or it doesn't show. Yeah. So everybody's having to practice genuinely looking yeah. as if they're glad to see people. Yeah. You sent us another text uh, lately, um, In Dreams We Make Our Future, and that's also about beauty and caring, and also about the, the ripples of beauty that go on from one to a person to another. Would you read that to us as a conclusion of this reading? Absolutely, delighted. Um, and obviously the thing to bear in mind, this was like, what, week Week two of the lockdown is quite I think early. so, beginning of March, yeah, or middle of yeah. March, yeah. Yeah, so obviously, you know, things are much worse now. Mm. I don't know what I was worried about. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. So, in dreams we make our future. Our government has no care for us at all. They refuse help on our behalf. Test kits, ventilators, protective equipment, are all left to others. They offer us assisted suicide. They plan to convert Birmingham Airport into a mortuary for thousands of dead. I flew into Birmingham Airport one morning long ago, hoping I would make it see my grandfather one last time. He died, I think, while I was in the air, his brother at his bedside. I left from the same airport later that day, having sat beside a body empty of all that my grandfather was. So empty, he made me believe in the soul. He didn't die in isolation. He was buried with due dignity. 
an undertaker with a gleaming top hat doffed it to the coffin before walking for the first few paces of the journey to the crematorium. My grandfather's body wasn't stacked like wood in amongst thousands of others. We didn't live together in a time like that. We had the luxury of mourning. Our government has no care for us at all, but we care. We care for each other. Every day we remember more, see more, discover more about how much we care and in how much detail. After more than a decade of escalating lessons in paranoia and hate, monetized cruelty, the greater part of us are held at peace. Unemployed, unemployment suspended, uncertain, we still have these silent streets, these clean skies, this unruly triumph of emotion when we see a bird, a tree, an unrequested blossom. We volunteer to bring shopping to people suddenly rendered almost impossibly vulnerable. We remember our phones can make calls as well as feed obsessions talk and talk to old friends, family, anyone and everyone we suddenly love differently and more. What there remains of business communication becomes also personal as we realize what was always true. Anyone we encounter could die at any time and therefore demands our mercy. We are learning tenderness, charity, gratitude. We sit for the most part in our homes and have all this strangely sized time in which to discover who we were before busyness stole us. We have space in which to remember how scared we are and how scared everyone else is. How terrible now it would be to be weak. We have been taught to hate the weak and had more or less accepted the lesson. New lessons visit us now from all sides and in dreams turn suddenly vivid. Kindness is visible now as light rather than weakness. Selfishness is becoming as ugly as it always was. Cruelty is unbearable to even consider as it always should have been. Our values have a chance to slowly overturn as the underpaid the refugees, the immigrants, the overlooked keep on saving us. Van drivers, cleaners, hospital porters, supermarket shelf stackers, care home workers and shop assistants. The least regarded jobs are seen clearly as the most necessary. We winnow millionaires into those who help and those who don't. And in those peculiar dreams, full of childhood poems and tangled sheets, we hear the tread of soft-soled shoes along hospital corridors, the care and care and care, the battling for breath. Once we built a health service we could all share. We raised it up after a terrible war, after stacked bodies and temporary mortuaries, after the waste and ruin of paranoia and hate and monetized cruelty. And then we forgot why we all needed it and decided that it should no longer make health, but money instead. We didn't cheer at it 8pm every evening. We didn't all thank it in whatever prayers we said each night for what it has saved and what it might have to save. We let it slip almost away. Now, a dark wave breaks over us, and we are dying for the lack of all it could have been for us. Every day, a nurse here, a doctor there, a respiratory specialist there, the fevers, the coughing, the inadequate protection. Our healthcare workers come, become patients, slip toward the ventilators, the drowning on dry land knowing there aren't enough ventilators. Still, the staff go to work. The retired return to work. 
helps the students leave their studies and they try to save us. They run into our burning building while our government pours petrol through our windows and locks the doors. In the time after, some of us will have the chance to keep hold of who we truly are, left to ourselves in silence. We can choose to remember what is important. We can remember how much we are able to sacrifice for the sake of life and for love. We can remember the sweetness of clean skies, clear waters, peace, the blessing of birds, know how much we can achieve together, how strong we can be when our survival is at stake, how strong we can be for our planet. We can remember the necessity of beauty, compassion, collaboration, hope. We will remember who helped and who did not. Thank you so much. And I would just suggest we, we leave these sentences and let them find their resonance in, in everybody of us. Thank you very much, Ayala Kennedy, for this great gift of literature you gave us tonight and for sharing with us your thoughts, also your feelings. Thanks to our audience for, for joining in. Um, I would just like briefly to to announce the next few programs in the AI Home, that's Daniel Schmidt. Um, this is America on Tuesday, and Roger Devec on Wednesday. And again, thank you very much to Essex AI Kennedy. It was, as always, a pleasure and a really a deep joy to have you here. Thanks a lot. Well, a good evening you. to you. Be well. Also, the best greetings to the thank UK, you. of course. And thank a good you. evening to all of us. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Okay.